northern New Jersey. Thank you so much for joining the Essex Metro Immunization Coalition meeting. We have a great agenda today featuring two incredible guest speakers, and they're going to uh, share their expertise and insights on all things COVID-19. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Joseph Schwab from the New Jersey Medical School. Dr. Schwab is also chair of the um, Essex Metro Coalition Group, and he is going to ask for approval of our December minutes and will also introduce our guest speakers. Thank you, Dr. Schwab. I will let you take over. Okay, thanks, Colleen. And I'd like to offer my welcome to everybody who's on the webinar as well. We're really happy to have everybody here today. Um, we have an exciting agenda planned. Um, we're also looking for your uh, updates from the membership and you'll hear some of the work that's going on at the end um, with our own coalition. Uh, one matter of business is the approval of the minutes, which I think everyone has received. So the way we'll work at this time, uh, since it's on webinar, is that if anybody has any additions or corrections to the minutes, please just send those in through the chat. Um, if anyone objects to the minutes, you can let us know. Otherwise, um, we'll take it as approval with the corrections and additions um, by the end of the meeting. Um, and so since we do have a packed agenda, I think we'll just move right into our speakers. So um, first I'd like to introduce our uh, first speaker, Dr. Uh, Meg Fisher. Uh, the full, full bio for Dr. Fisher is um, attached to the materials, but I'm going to highlight a few things by way of introduction. So welcome, Dr. Fisher. Um, Dr. Fisher is a well-known uh, specialist in pediatric infectious diseases here in New Jersey, as well as nationally and internationally. She studied at UCLA School of Medicine and trained in pediatrics and in pediatric infectious diseases at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children in Philadelphia. Uh, she recently joined the New Jersey Department of Health as a special advisor to the Commissioner of Health, and she works as the Medical Director of Clinical and Academic Excellence at Monmouth Medical Center and is a clinical professor of pediatrics at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Dr. Fisher is a frequent invited speaker on immunizations. She's published extensively on pediatric infectious diseases and has served nationally as an advisor on immunizations to the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as at the CDC. She's received multiple awards for teaching and community service, and we're happy to welcome her here today to speak to us on vaccines during the COVID-19 pandemic. So welcome, Dr. Fisher, and there will be time for questions after each of our speakers. Uh, you can put those through in the chat as well. Thanks, it's uh, certainly a pleasure for me to be here um, and to be talking to you about uh, vaccines during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And the reason I have this disclaimer is that new information is truly appearing just about every day, sometimes every hour. So the recommendations change very frequently. So what you hear today from me may be out of date by the time I get finished talking to you, uh, by the end of today, by the end of the week, or certainly by the end of the month. So what I really want you to, to be aware of are that there are very good trusted sources uh, for up-to-date information. These websites are updated literally every day. So there's the New Jersey Department of Health and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So those will give you the new things that are happening. So let's just start with a few basics about COVID-19. Obviously it's a real disease and it can be serious, but it also can be very non-serious. So disease with COVID-19 varies from no symptoms at all to mild common cold symptoms to pneumonia, or to multi-organ system involvement in death. And unfortunately, we can't always predict which person will have no symptoms at all or which person will end up on a ventilator and eventually um, succumb. We do know that the incidence of severe disease increases with increasing age. We also know that if you have comorbidities, other health problems, you are at increased risk to get severe disease. 
Now, the one uh, good, nice thing about this uh, pandemic is that disease in children has almost always been either no symptoms at all, totally asymptomatic, or just mild symptoms. There is an exception to the rule. There are always exceptions to the rule. And this exception is a condition called multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And this occurs about a month after a child recovers from having been infected with the COVID-19 um, disease with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And this is actually a post-infectious problem. And what seems to be the problem is that the body's inflammatory response goes a little bit berserk and there is overwhelming inflammation and evidence of inflammation. And instead of it killing off the virus, the virus is probably already gone, it actually um, acts against the person. So it's a rare post-infectious complication with an inflammatory response that is now acting against the child. Fortunately, it's very treatable um, and most, almost all children will recover completely. But it's a frightening disease that can, be, uh, can present with, uh, with shock or uh, with uh, involvement of the heart. So this, um, this disease, COVID-19, is caused by this virus, SARS-CoV-2, and we know that it's spread from person to person, primarily by droplets that people make when they talk or sneeze or cough or sing, or even just breathing. These droplets come out of your airways, out of your mouth. Now, generally, those droplets will fall harmlessly to the ground within about three feet and certainly within about six feet or about two arm lengths. However, if someone's close to you, those droplets can land in a person's eyes or they can be inhaled in the air that you're breathing and therefore transmit the infection. Now, rarely the virus is truly airborne and will travel farther, greater distance. And these are those so-called super spreader events that you may have heard about, where one person in a choir managed to infect everybody in the area, or one person at a restaurant managed to infect people many tables away. But those are the exception. The rule is that the major way this is spread is by droplets. And we will, when we look at this picture, you can see the kind of droplets that form when a person sneezes. And you can see that most of these are dropping down harmlessly to the ground within that three feet, but some of them are gonna go a little bit further and may go as far as six feet or occasionally even more. I think you could also imagine that if this person was wearing a mask, that those droplets would all go into the mask and not out into the air. So remember, most uh, children and many, many adults will have no symptoms at all when they're infected. So they won't know that they're contagious. Some will develop a mild flu-like illness and the common symptoms are fever, chills, cough, difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, fatigue or body aches, headache, sore throat, congestion or runny nose, nausea or vomiting and diarrhea. Exactly the same symptoms that you see with influenza. The two unique symptoms for COVID-19 disease are loss of taste and loss of smell. Now, not everyone who gets the disease will lose taste or smell. And the good news is it's a transient loss. Your taste and smell come back. Um, but if you have those symptoms, and other flu-like symptoms, it's likely you have COVID-19. The lung disease in COVID-19 can pro progress from upper respiratory to lower respiratory pneumonia and then to respiratory failure. And that can then, uh, a person in respiratory failure can go into multi-system organ failure and shock. And severe disease, again, is most common in older people. So the majority of deaths that you're going to see are in people over 75 years of age, but we do see severe disease and deaths all the way down to young adults. Very rare though in children, not unheard of, but rare. So what about children? Well, children are not particularly getting sick from COVID-19, the virus, but 
there have been tremendous, tremendous effects on children. They have lost their family members. They've lost their grandparents. They've, some of them have lost parents. They've lost aunts and uncles and friends of the family. And unfortunately, they haven't been able to participate in anything like a funeral or those kind of ceremonies because we've all been in isolation and in and, and, and kind of in, in intermittent lockdown. Some of their parents have lost their jobs or had decreases in their salary because of lockdown. There's been a tremendous increase in poverty. The rich have gotten richer, but unfortunately, the middle class and the poor have gotten poorer. Children have lost in-person schooling, and this is a huge loss. If you think about it, schooling is the job of childhood. Getting through school is their job. So they have essentially all been pretty much unemployed or poorly employed because we know that sitting in front of a computer is not nearly the same as going to school and learning in person with your teachers. Children have been isolated and inactive. People have gained weight. People have developed a whole variety of anxiety and depressive disorders. And this is particularly true of teenagers. We're seeing across the country far more admissions for children who, um, who are depressed or are even having suicidal ideation. Finally, children have missed their well child care. Early in the epidemic, everyone was afraid to go out. There was lockdown. You only went out if you really needed to. So many, many, many children lost that well child care. So they are behind on their immunizations and they have totally missed some of the screening tests and all of the anticipatory guidance. So whether it's a lead check or whether it's an autism check or whether it's a vision test or a hearing test, children have missed out on all of that screening and of course, all of the anticipatory guidance that pediatricians give and, and give them um, with every visit. Well, what can we do to protect ourselves? So if we think about how the virus is spread, it makes sense what we do to protect ourselves. So we use the mask. What does the mask do when it's put on properly? It covers your nose and your mouth. A mask sits down here, doesn't do any good. I see this all the time when I watch the basketball players and look at their coaches. This is terrible. And it's a terrible example to set for your players. The mask should be up covering the nose, covering the mouth, and as snug as possible. The idea of double masking is to decrease the amount of that can escape when you breathe. Now, what does the mask do? It prevents the droplets from going out. And as you're breathing in, it also prevents you from breathing in the droplets. Next thing you wanna do is keep that physical distance. And you notice I don't say socially distancing. We don't want people socially distant. We want them to be socially connected, but at a distance. So the distance is the six feet because that's how you stay away from the droplets. We also want people to avoid crowds because it's very hard to keep that physical distance when you're in a crowd. And when you're in a crowd, you're going to be exposed to many more people who could be asymptomatically infected. We want you to wash your hands often. We want you to stay away from sick people if that's possible. And we want you to stay home when you're sick. This is something healthcare providers don't do very well. You know, we, we got to punch through, you know, push through. No, if you're not feeling well, if there's any question at all, stay home, don't expose other people. And finally, we want you to get vaccinated. And now we're gonna talk about those vaccines. So there are three vaccines right now that are available for use. Two are messenger RNA vaccines. The Pfizer vaccine received its um, emergency use authorization on December 11th, and it was, uh, it is used for children 16 and older and adults, obviously older uh, than 16. The Moderna vaccine got its uh, authorization on 12-18, and it's for ages 18 and older. The J&J &J vaccine is the new player on the road. It got its uh, authorization at the end of February, and it's for ages 18 and older. So what do these uh, messenger RNA vaccines do? Well, first of all, both of them are two dose series. So for Pfizer, the first dose is, is, is at day zero and the next at three weeks. For Moderna, 
day zero and second dose at four weeks. And both of the doses that you receive should be the same vaccine. You're not to mix and match these. So what does the mRNA vaccine do? So the messenger RNA is a little piece of code that codes for a certain protein, the spike protein, that's that cranberry uh, colored stuff on the outside of the coronavirus. So that little code is put into a small fat uh, particle, so a, a lipid uh, nanoparticle, and then that's injected into your muscle. In your muscle, the, um, the lipid nanoparticle allows that piece of RNA to get into your muscle cells. When it enters the cells, the cells read the code and produce the protein, the spike protein. Your body then says, wait a minute, spike protein, that's not us, that's, that's a foreign material. So we're gonna make an immune response to that foreign material and you make antibody and you also make cell mediated immunity. So both T cell immunity and B cell immunity. So, so you're all set that if you get exposed to the virus, the whole virus, you'll have protection against those spikes. And remember the spike protein is what allows the virus to, to uh, actually connect to the cells in your nose and your throat and your lungs. So if you block that connection, you're not gonna get sick from the virus. Now the J&J &J vaccine uses a similar uh, deal, but instead of that lipid monoparticle, nanoparticle rather, it uses an adenovirus to carry that little uh, spike protein message. So it's the spike protein information inside an adenovirus, and that adenovirus is designed so that it can't replicate in a person. It can't make you sick. And it's a little bit different from the usual adenoviruses we have. So the vast majority of people are not immune to it. So when the adenovirus is given, the adenovirus enters the cells, releases that code for the spike protein, and again, your immune system responds. And this requires just one dose. However, it's important to remember that the J&J &J vaccine is being tested with um, a second dose to see if that um, makes any difference in the long-term immunity. So all three of these vaccines were tested uh, and, uh, and authorized, but the tests continue to go on and they will continue for another two years. So how were these vaccines developed so quickly? Well, the thing that you need to remember here is that this is not new technology. The messenger RNA vaccines have been uh, talked about and developed over the last more than a decade. So the first idea of using them against um, a coronavirus was back in 2003 with the first severe, um, the, the first SARS outbreak, severe uh, respiratory syndrome. Severe something respiratory syndrome. So severe acute respiratory syndrome. So when when that SARS outbreak occurred in in 2003, the companies were already starting to try to to make a vaccine. And then, for unknown reasons, the first SARS um, epidemic went away in 2004. So a vaccine wasn't needed. But that messenger RNA technology has been used for other vaccines. And the same is true of the adenoviral vectors. In fact, they have been used since the 1990s when they were used as a way to maybe put some genetic material to add genetic material. So both of these uh, processes are already known. The other thing that happened was the clinical trials, they go through phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. But instead of doing phase one and then talking to the FDA, and if they say, okay, then go to phase two, talk to the FDA. If they say, okay, go to phase three. If they say, okay, then manufacture the, your vaccine. Everything happened at once. So phase one started, and then about halfway through phase one, phase two started, about halfway through phase two, phase three started, and the companies were told, go ahead and manufacture the vaccine. If it works, we're, we're ready to buy it for you. So there was a tremendous investment in this process and there were a lot of brilliant people from all over the world uh, working on it. So all of the trials for these vaccines have included people of different races and different ethnicities, 
different ages. And unlike many trials, these trials have included people with underlying conditions. So a lot of times we just test uh, vaccines in healthy adults or healthy children. But this time, because we're very concerned about people who are also had high blood pressure or heart disease or whatever, these trials included those, um, those people. There have not been any head-to-head -head trials of efficacy. So nobody's compared Pfizer to J&J, &J, Pfizer to Moderna, et cetera. The trials that were done for the efficacy were done at completely different times in completely different locations. And the big difference is the trials for Pfizer and Moderna were done before we had all of these variants. So the efficacy of Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J &J really can't be compared head to head because it was just at that time that they were being tested. And remember, all these trials will be ongoing, so we'll get more information. Side effects of uh, COVID-19 vaccines are pretty much the same side effects we get with most vaccines. So pain where, where the injection site is, and then common symptoms are fatigue, fever, and headache. And these are really signs that your immune system is working. Now, don't get nervous. If you don't have side effects after the vaccine, it doesn't mean it didn't work. It just means that your immune system didn't give you those other uh, symptoms. The risk for severe reaction is incredibly low, way less than 1%, so 0.5%. And the, as far as which severe reactions for the Pfizer Moderna, the anaphylaxis has been, again, very rare, um, one to two per million kind of, of, uh, of incidents. And it has been seen in people who have had uh, anaphylactic reactions to other things like medicines that are given um, IV and also um, other vaccines. So if you have a history of anaphylaxis, you should talk to your doctor and you should let the people at the vaccine center know. And of course, take your EpiPen so that you'll be ready should anything happen. But of course, at all the vaccine uh, sites, they have the ability to manage anaphylaxis. Uh, something nice for, for people with white hair like uh, myself, um, side effects are less common in people over 50, and they're also more common after the second dose. So makes sense. There are actually less side effects with J&J &J because it's a single dose. Um, and and uh, likewise, a few more side effects in people with um, Pfizer or Moderna. But most of those side effects are relatively, relatively mild, and they're gone within about 24 to 48 hours. So how have we rolled out the vaccine in New Jersey? Well, our goal in New Jersey is to vaccinate at least 70% of the adult population, and that's 4.7 million people. We want to vaccinate anyone who lives, works, or goes to school in New Jersey. And of course, they have to want the vaccine. The first group to get vaccinated, and that was on uh, December 18th, were frontline healthcare workers. At the same time as the healthcare workers were immunized, we took people who we knew were at the highest risk, and those were people in group settings such as nursing homes, group homes, and also people who were in jails, because in that congregate setting, they can't get away from each other and they really can't avoid exposure. And of course, healthcare workers were, um, were, were first because we need them to be available to take care of, uh, to take care of us. The next phase on January 7th, we added first responders, and those were the sworn law enforcement agents and fire professionals. On, in the middle of January, we increased it to everybody over 65 years of age, whether you were in a congregate setting or at home, and people between the ages of 16 to 64 with these health conditions. Now, why do we pick those people? Actually, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices suggested this was the way you should, it should be rolled out in phases. However, as you'll notice, each state has done that a little bit differently, but these were the ones we chose. And again, this is based on the CDC recommendations. So the health conditions, cancer, kidney disease, uh, lung disease, specifically uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, uh, Down syndrome, heart disease, obesity, sickle cell, smoking, and type two diabetes, because these are the ones that the CDC said these people are at higher risk. Also, we know pregnant people and people who are immunocompromised are at increased risk, but the caveat is they should talk to their healthcare provider first to be sure that the vaccine 
is uh, is right for them. On March 6, we expanded to educators and uh, school staff, so anyone who works in a school and also childcare workers. And then just this week, we expanded it to transportation workers, public safety, migrant farm workers, tribal communities, anyone who's homeless or lives in a shelter. And then we added some additional health conditions, which also do increase your risk for severe disease. So you can see that the idea here is to protect the people who are most likely to get the, get the sickest and also to protect people who need to keep our systems going. On March 29th, we're gonna expand much further to uh, food production people, agriculture, food distribution, so the grocery stores, elder care and support people, warehouses, logistics, social services. You can read through the list. This is going to be much, much, much of the population. And then um, the president has announced that he would like by May 1st, anyone who wants the vaccine who's over 16 should be able to get it. So we will strive to get there. I'm not sure how fast we'll do it, but things are moving a lot faster than we expected. Now, the big problem is we have many more people who want the vaccine than we have vaccine. So, and we have uh, scheduling systems that don't talk to each other. So the New Jersey vaccine scheduling system is, I've given you the website here. This is where we want everyone to sign up for the vaccine. So go to this, this uh, portal and sign in. If you don't have a computer, you can get help in, to be signed in at our call center. And the number is there, 855-568-0545. So you wanna get registered and then you will get an email saying you've effectively registered. And then you'll get an email saying whether or not you're eligible. So a couple important things to know, you don't need insurance to get vaccinated, but you will be asked for your insurance card. Now, why would we ask you? Because the vaccination sites are allowed to bill for the administration of the vaccine and they will get paid um, by the, the federal government or your insurance company, not by you. So there's no um, double billing. There's no, you should not be asked for any money to get a vaccine. If you are asked, probably that is not a legitimate vaccine. And there are a lot of scams happening out there. Your immigration status doesn't matter. This is for documented, undocumented. It doesn't matter. You do though, at the moment, have to have an appointment. Although we're beginning to develop some walk-up sites where you won't need an advanced appointment. When you register, you'll, you'll be um, told that you can pick a vaccination location and you'll be supplied with the, the uh, contacts for the vaccination locations near you. And again, you'll get the email reminders when you're ready and then a reminder to get a second dose if you need it. So what information you're gonna be asked for, your name, address, gender, and race. We really wanna know gender and race because we wanna be sure that we're giving the vaccine out as equitably as possible. You'll also ask, be asked some medical screening questions and your occupation so we can determine whether you're eligible for the vaccine or not. All of the information that's collected is used for public health purposes only. It's not given to ISIS or to the federal government or to anyone else. It's just so we know who's gotten vaccine in New Jersey and it also helps us get you the second dose of the same vaccine. So after you get that first dose, we want you to go ahead and make an appointment for the second dose if you need it. So if you have Pfizer or Moderna, you need both doses. Hold on to the card that you get at your vaccination site so you know which type of vaccine you received and the date. Remember that two weeks after your second dose, you're considered immune for Pfizer and Moderna. For uh, the J&J &J vaccine, it's two to three weeks after that first dose. So remember, it takes time for your body to make that immune response. We do want you after you're immunized to continue to wear the face mask and keep your physical distance. No vaccine is 100% effective. And we also don't know if the vaccines prevent asymptomatic infection. So we know it pr protects you from getting sick and being hospitalized, but maybe you can have the virus in your system. And if you have the virus and you don't have symptoms, you may still be able to transmit it. So we don't know how contagious you might be. So therefore we want you to continue to wear the mask and keep that physical distance. So just a few uh, facts to kind of, kind of uh, sum it up. 
None of these vaccines are live vaccines. None of them are the even the killed virus. So you can't get the disease from the COVID vaccine. They won't cause you to test positive on the PCR tests or the antigen tests, okay? So remember, you're making antibody to the spike protein. So it will not make your test positive. If you test positive on a nasal swab, it means that you're infected with the virus. <laughs> now, what if you've already had COVID-19? Should you still get the vaccine? So the answer is yes, because we don't know how long natural disease protects you, but there's no rush. So if you have COVID now, we don't want you to get the vaccine because we don't want you to transmit that virus to the people who are giving out vaccines. So you have to wait until you recover, but you should wait longer than that. You should really wait three months to get the vaccine. We know you're protected for three months. We're in a vaccine shortage time right now. So you should wait, let someone who isn't protected get that vaccine, but then come back at three months and go ahead and get vaccinated. Because again, we don't know how long protection lasts. So if you were infected last March, yes, get the vaccine now. If you were infected last week, wait the three months. Remember that getting vaccinated helps prevent you from getting sick, but we don't know for sure if it will prevent you from uh, having the virus in your system. And we don't know if it will keep you from transmitting the virus to someone else. But it's going to protect you from the illness and we'd much prefer that you don't get sick. This messenger RNA can't get into your nucleus of your cells. It's RNA, it's not DNA. It's, it's uh, metabolized in your body. It's gone within uh, less than a day. So it's not going to change anything about your genetic makeup. So don't worry that the, the messenger RNA is going to do that. And the J&J &J vaccine, the adenovirus, doesn't change uh, your genetic makeup either. These um, vaccines, not only the messenger RNA, but the adenovirus RNA has nothing to do with fertility. It doesn't affect fertility, doesn't affect eggs or sperm, and it doesn't have anything to do with the placenta. So there was some concern that maybe the spike protein is similar to the way a placenta looks, and you might uh, increase the risk of uh, the placenta not being able to implant. That has absolutely not been shown to be the case. And the body, again, breaks down this vaccine in a couple days. So getting vaccinated protects you from getting sick, but we still want you to wear the mask and we still want you to, to keep that six foot distance as much as possible. So what do I want you to do for us? I want you to know why COVID-19 needs to be taken seriously, that this disease can be prevented. The vaccine is effective and it can prevent you from getting, the, getting sick. People over 16 who live, work, or go to school in New Jersey can get the vaccine, and we want you to get whichever vaccine is available as soon as you can. You can also get the vaccine if you have insurance or if you don't have insurance, if you're a citizen or not a citizen. So now you know the facts about the vaccine, and we'd like you to go tell someone else and encourage others to go ahead and get vaccinated. And I'm going to uh, stop there. Um, I think uh, my timing is okay. Um, I do want to just mention the uh, variants. Um, there are new variants coming up all the time with uh, this virus as with any virus. We don't know for sure how, um, how well the vaccines will work against the variants. Uh, we know that, that for the UK variant, which is the one that's most common in New Jersey, all three vaccines work very well. It's the, the, the variant that was first recognized in South Africa that it seems like Moderna doesn't work quite as well and the J&J &J doesn't work quite as well. And the AstraZeneca doesn't work quite as well. We don't know as much about the P1 variant, which is from Brazil. But again, variants are coming up. There's a New York variant, a California variant. Um, there, there probably will be a New Jersey variant. We, we don't, there's lots of things we don't know, but what we want is for as many people as possible to get vaccinated before the variants are a problem, because if we can stop the virus from replicating, because there's no more people that get sick, then we know we can stop the variants. So I'm gonna stop there and uh, ask, uh, ask for questions.
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Fisher. That was a great presentation. Um, I'm gonna go look in our question box over here and see what we have. Oh, wait a minute, I didn't do that. Okay. okay. Here's your first question. Um, given the importance of school attendance and the lack of vaccine availability to children, what are the best recommendations for schools to open safely and how should we advise families about sending their children to school? So um, there's been some nice studies now that have looked at whether or not the virus, whether or not school is important in the transmission of the virus and whether or not children are spreading the virus in school. And the good news is that children are not spreading the virus in schools that are using masks and physical distancing. So a nice study from um, Massachusetts, uh, Wisconsin, and another study uh, recently came out, both showed the same thing. The rates of transmission were actually less in school than they were in the communities. So I think that people should feel pretty good about going to school. Uh, we know that, that um, the spread that has occurred in school has been mainly from the teachers, teacher to teacher, or occasionally teacher to student. And uh, we are trying very hard to get all the teachers uh, immunized so that even that small risk of transmission uh, will be less. Um, you should also know that all three of the pharmaceutical companies are now doing studies in children. The Pfizer um, has studied children down to age 12 and they've uh, actually finished their enrollment in that trial. Moderna has studied children down to age 12 and just started another study of children down to six months. And J&J uh, &J is also studying uh, the, the vaccine uh, efficacy in children. So we will have more information. And I think maybe by uh, the end of the summer or sometime during the summer, we'll know whether or not these vaccines will be released for use in children. Great, thank you so much. You partially answered the second question was, are we going to have vaccines for children soon before they reopen schools? And basically, you think that might be the case, Dr. Fisher? Uh, it, it's, it, it, different people have guessed different times. Um, I think that uh, we may have it uh, available uh, by fall or winter. I'm not sure we'll have everybody immunized before school starts. But again, I, I want to, to, to remind parents that as long as the schools are using the, um, the masks and the physical distancing, um, and there's now actually information that three feet apart is as good as six feet apart. That's a study in Massachusetts. So as long as they're, they're doing those um, important public health things, that school absolutely is safe with or without vaccines, but we're gonna make it even safer as we get people vaccinated. Terrific, thank you. Uh, the next question I have is, um, can you talk about, there's been some uh, on the news about the AstraZeneca vaccine and blood clots. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I think uh, many people are very disappointed that uh, several of the European countries have stopped uh, their studies of AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, the information, or at least the information that I've heard, is that the incidence of blood clots in the, in the people who receive the vaccine is about the same as would be expected in a population that age. So remember, you know, there are lots of things that happen to us as we get older. And if you happen to get a vaccine and now you get your, your, your blood clot, you're gonna think it was due to the vaccine, but mm -hmm. it may have just been that was gonna happen anyway. So it's a coincidence. So it appears that, um, that, that uh, there, uh, it would be expected that some people who get the vaccine would have blood clots. And most scientific people have said the incidence of blood clots is not higher than in the general population. And they really feel like the study should not have been stopped. Understood, understood. Now that we have three vaccines that are, that are rolled out in the United States, is there any, um, concern or is there any particular population that would be better suited for either vaccine? I know Moderna and Pfizer are two vaccines and their efficacy tends to be a bit better than J&J. &J. So is it recommended that if you um, have more 
comorbidities or are of a certain age you could get you should get a vaccine that has a higher efficacy rate or is it okay to just get all three just get vaccinated it's it's okay to get whichever vaccine is available just get vaccinated so remember that the moderna and the pfizer vaccines were both studied before we had the south african variant or the uh, uk variant so if we studied them again now, we don't know if the efficacy would be the same or if it would be less. But the fact is, all three vaccines protect against severe illness and death. So if you, if you can, get the vaccine. Now, are there special populations? Well, there are some people who are incredibly needle phobic and they really only want one shot. Hmm. For them then, it's the J&J vaccine. Um, there, there may be lots of people who, for whatever reason, really feel they want one shot and done, one and done. And, and you know, there's nothing wrong with that. At the moment, you can't really choose which vaccine you're going to get. When you get your appointment, you will have to get whatever uh, uh, vaccines available at that site. Um, in the future, I suspect that you will be able to choose which vaccine, but right now, Again, we want to get as many people immunized as quickly as we can. So you should get whatever you can get. There are also certain populations where you might not be able to get to them in three weeks or four weeks. So for instance, um, the homeless, it may be easier to use the, the one dose vaccine because you know that you can get everybody immunized right then and there. And again, there are going to be some people that would really prefer that. But as a, as a general rule, get what you get and don't get upset. <laughs> I say that to my children all the time. Um, we know from uh, you know the news and many other, other sources that there's still a, a good amount of vaccine hesitancy in people that really are not having confidence. Have you found any new studies that are showing that perhaps you know people are becoming more confident because so many people have been vaccinated without major uh, problems? Yes, that's absolutely true, but vaccine hesitancy persists um, in, you know, across um, all ages, across all uh, races. It is um, higher in people of color, and, and that's understandable. The healthcare system has, has uh, generally not treated people of color nearly as well as they treat uh, people that, of whites. Um, so I understand the hesitancy, but I think as more and more people are vaccinated, as people see um, their trusted colleagues getting vaccinated. As they hear about people who are vaccinated and are doing great and are now, you know, with the new CDC guidelines, people who are fully vaccinated are beginning to be able to come into small groups together and not be concerned. So as people are seeing that, I think the hesitancy is going down and we do have some studies. So when we looked uh, way back in, um, in, in in uh, July and August, um, less than 50% of people were interested in getting a vaccine. Everybody felt like things were moving too fast. It was political. There was all kinds of concern. However, now when we resurvey people, the uh, vaccine hesitancy has clearly dropped. And now at least 70% of people, and in some studies, a little more than 70% of people say that they would like to get the vaccine. Some people still are, you know, on the, on the, on the uh, ledge, you know, trying to decide on, on the fence is a better expression. Um, but many people, when given all this information and seeing that the, the epidemic is not going away by itself quite yet, um, really are, are ready to receive the vaccine. And we still currently have more demand for the vaccine than we have vaccine. Terrific, terrific. This is an interesting question. Um, if you could look into a crystal ball, do you think that the COVID vaccine is going to be similar to an annual influenza vaccine? So for COVID-19, um, I have tried to uh, not use crystal balls because every time I think I know what's happening, it, you know, it does something else, it does something different. I think it depends on how much uh, the variants come into play. You know, the first SARS outbreak went away with uh, on its own without any particular particular reason. The MERS, which is another coronavirus outbreak, has um, really not gotten out of, of the Arabian Peninsula. So each of the coronaviruses acts a little bit differently. 
We know we have lots of coronaviruses that circulate in children every year and actually in adults as well that just cause the common cold. So if somehow this just ends up ca causing the common cold, you know, maybe we won't need vaccines. If it continues to cause the disease it causes now, we may need vaccines. And it's important to remember that the pharmaceutical companies are already making booster doses that are aimed against that South African variant and uh, the Brazilian variant. So it may, may mean that even those of us who have been uh, fortunate enough to get fully immunized may need a booster down the road uh, to protect us against the variants. Thank you so much. Um, what a wealth of information and thank you so much for your time. I think we have run out of time for questions, um, but we thank you again and good luck with all the amazing work that you're doing. Thanks, I appreciate it. And now Dr. Schwab, could you please introduce our next speaker? Thank you, um, and thank you, Dr. Fisher. That was a wonderful talk, and I think stimulated a lot of thoughts and questions, and we really appreciate it. Um, for our next speaker, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Chris Purnell. Um, I would like to remind people that the full bios are um, attached on the, you'll see it on the sidebar of the um, GoToWebinar meeting if you'd like to read more, um, but I would like to offer a brief introduction here to Dr. Purnell and highlight some of her um, credentials and achievements in welcome. So Dr. Purnell is a physician leader who specializes in public health. Her focus is on health justice, community-based advocacy, and population-wide health promotion and disease prevention. Dr. Purnell is a graduate of Princeton University and of Duke University School of Medicine. She received a master's of public health from Columbia and completed her residency in preventive medicine at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Purnell recently joined University Hospital as our first Chief Strategic Integration and Health Equity Officer, and she's responsible to, for developing a health equity strategy and integrating equity and inclusion within the hospital system and across all operations. She also serves as a medical expert on the Essex County Civilian Task Force. Dr. Purnell is a frequent speaker in both professional and public forums on racial equity population health, social justice, community well-being, and faith-based initiatives. And we're happy to welcome her here today to speak on the twin pandemics, understanding COVID-19 through the lens of health equity. So welcome, Dr. Purnell. Thank you, Dr. Schwab. So I'm just going to prepare to... Oh, excellent. So good afternoon, everyone. Very happy to be with you and to be able to have this dialogue. And I reference this as a dialogue because even when I'm presenting, I hope it leads to the generation of thoughts or ideas or questions that we can engage in and can be the launching pad for action planning and solution building. So again, twin pandemics, understanding COVID-19 through the lens of health equity. Um, I've been in this role of Chief Strategic Integration and Health Equity Officer since November 2019. So you can imagine the majority of my time here at University Hospital has been focused around the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I am a public health and preventive medicine physician that focuses around issues of health equity and really centers that health equity work around anti-racism strategies as well as broader um, multiple dimensions of equity. And uh, I'll try to infuse some of those thoughts into the presentation when I'm describing both national and state scenarios. So I always start here. Um, and I think it's very important to start here because when we see the statistics or we see the numbers, it is very possible to get lost in that information. And data is most powerful when data tells a story. And so I want to uplift the names, uplift the faces of those whom we've lost to this unprecedented public health crisis. So I begin here this compilation that ABC News put together that I thought was striking the very first time 
that I saw it. And I want to um, call out in particular this woman whose uh, face I'm circling with my cursor there. Um, that's Kim King Smith. Um, she worked here at University Hospital. She was an EKG technician. Um, she worked um, the night shift. She worked here for several decades. As you can see, her family describes her smile as being one that can brighten and um, lighten any situation. And we still um, grieve and mourn her loss. And I think it's so important for those of us in healthcare to intentionally reflect, right? And to have space to remember because that's part of our healing and our recovery. So the first confirmed case in the United States was reported on January 20th, 2020. Um, that doesn't mean that's when coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 um, was introduced to community. That was the first laboratory confirmed diagnosis in the United States. Since then, um, the CDC has now reporting over 533,000 deaths. And unfortunately, that number is probably even ticked up today since I updated this presentation and over 29 million cases to date nationally. If we look at our local picture here in New Jersey, the New Jersey Department of Health reports 21,492 confirmed deaths and approximately 747,000 confirmed cases across the state as of March, so early March 2021. If we break down those confirmed deaths um, here in the state of New Jersey, 56% of the deaths have been among um, white persons, 19% of the deaths uh, among Latinx population, 16% of the deaths among Blacks or African Americans, 5% of the deaths are among Asians. Um, Bergen, Middlesex, and Essex rank the highest in mortality across New Jersey counties. And there you see Latinos, Blacks, and Asians highlighted in yellow because in the year 2020, coronavirus is the leading or was the leading cause of death for Latinos, Blacks, and Asians. And I do that to immediately center us. Um, the takeaways from this slide unprecedented public health crisis, and, and I'm sure you know that. Um, un, unseen, unheard devastation, and the devastation was not just in the loss of lives, the devastation was in the loss of our social fabric, um, the devastation was also in the economic devastation, um, and I think it's very important to understand that while everyone was affected or impacted by this pandemic, there has been disproportionate impact in uh, black and brown communities. So one way to think about uh, how many deaths that have occurred is to think about are those deaths occurring at a higher percentage than those groups are in the general population share. And unfortunately, that is yes. If we go forward, um, it is also important for me to speak and name my father. Um, in addition to Kim King Smith, I lost my father personally, a personal loss for me in this pandemic. Um, my father is 78 year old African American male with multiple chronic health conditions. And I think it's very important for you to know that detail um, I lost him on April 13th. My dad um, died in a hospital merely four miles away from the hospital where I currently work. Um, and I say that so we can get a sense of the timing of March and April. We were very much the epicenter of this pandemic and that epicenter personally landed on me. Um, and I saw that epicenter land on the patients in our hospital, nearly every bed filled with a person um, who was suffering from coronavirus from very severe cases to to milder or moderate cases um, and to what we know happened more broadly in Newark, in Essex County, in New Jersey, in this region and across the United States. In addition to losing my father, unfortunately, I've now lost two cousins, not just long before uh, the new year. Um, and one of them, my cousin Franklin Boswell, or Thomas Franklin Boswell, who we called Frankie, was a postal worker. Also, I think very important for you to know detail because uh, we saw disproportionate impact, not just in black and brown communities, but to understand what were driving uh, those factors or trends. Uh, blacks and browns represent service and production industries um, at 43%, according to recent US census data, as opposed to whites who represent about 25%. And that gives us some understanding. Uh, 
finally, um, my sister, my sister, um, Kim Maria Walker, who is what we describe as a long COVID-19 hauler, long hauler. Uh, my sister got diagnosed with COVID-19 um, around late April, um, and it took her, wow, at minimum 10 months to recover. Um, and she just recently went back to work. My sister, another important fact, breast cancer survivor and work at a large chain retail store. So it was considered a critical infrastructure or a critical or essential worker who worked during the pandemic but didn't have adequate access to PPE. What we politely call a health disparity is killing people of color daily. It is causing people of color to live sicker and to die quicker because of the color of their skin. A very um, profound quote here um, by Dean Dana Bowen Matthew, who is the author of Just Medicine, A Cure for Racial Inequality in American Healthcare. Uh, likewise, um, the Dean, um, she has challenged us in healthcare, um, particularly healthcare executives, to envision and model their hospitals as hubs of racial healing. And this pandemic and the collision of this pandemic with the pandemic assistive racism explains why that imperative and mandate. So if you look at this chart here um, produced by the CDC, data as of February 18th, and 18th, 2021, you see that disproportionate burden, whether in cases or hospitalizations or death. Um, hospitalizations range in anywhere from three to 3.7 times approximately higher for Black and Latino and Indigenous groups. Um, death anywhere from 2 to 2.4 and higher for Black and Latino and Indigenous groups. While we see not the same level of disproportionate um, disproportionality, I should say, in, in Asians, I do want to caveat that, that there is great diversity within the Asian American community. Um, great diversity by ethnicity, great diversity by socioeconomic status. So agents too have experienced a disproportionate impact. And that's why I wanted to point out in New Jersey, coronavirus in 2020 was the leading cause of death for agents, Blacks and Latinos. The CDC says that race and ethnicity are the risk um, markers. I go a step further, as do others in the field, and says racism is the risk marker and thinking about racism as a pre-existing condition. So the color of coronavirus, uh, the APM Research Lab has done prolific work in this area during the pandemic um, and where I go frequently to track and to monitor, monitor data of COVID-19 deaths by race and ethnicity in the United States. I think it's important that I define racism for you. Dr. Cameron Jones, a prolific scholar in the field, um, says that racism is a system of structuring opportunity um, whereby groups are assigned value based on their phenotype or their skin color or the social construct of race and leading to one community or population being advantaged because of that value, another population or community being disadvantaged because of assigned value, but the strength of the society as a whole being sapped through the waste of human potential and human resources. So that's what I mean when I say those fast and slow pandemics or those twin pandemics. We see systemic racism, that slow pandemic that unfortunately has been rooted in even the founding of the nation and with us still today in structures, processes, norms, behaviors occurring at different levels, whether systemic or institutional or structural or personalized or interpersonal being personally mediated. So according to the most recent data by the color of coronavirus project, um, you see uh, the, the mortality um, per race and ethnic groups, one in 390 for indigenous Americans or 256 deaths per 100,000, one in 555 uh, black Americans has died or 179.8 deaths per 100,000. And I won't read each one, but I want that to settle with all of us here today. Um, and so coronavirus being that fast pandemic, this novel infectious agent that literally ripped across the globe in a little bit over a year, and then that slow pandemic causing earthquakes of devastation in black and brown communities.
So this again also is from the APM Research Lab, and this is age-adjusted mortality um, data. And so again, we see that range is comparable to what the CDC reported, anywhere from roughly 2 to 2.6 um, times more likely to die of COVID-19 than white Americans are Blacks, Latinos, um, Indigenous and Pacific Islander um, populations and communities. There is research that is emerging. Dr. Cheryl Barber, another prolific scholar in the field, wrote a great piece in uh, The Lancet called Death by Racism, um, who talks about these interlocking systems of racism, who talks about that, that stat that I referenced that Blacks and Latinos occupy 43% of the service and production industries according to the U.S. Census tract versus 25% of whites, and how high contact jobs um, serve to accumulate additional risk in addition to living in a very cramped or crowded dwelling, the root of residential, of racial residential segregation, and also the root of um, households being multi-generational. Um, and her research that is continuing to emerge, she's with Drexel now, had been with UCLA, shows that um, Blacks are dying at even younger ages, um, and Blacks are not not only dying at younger ages, Blacks are dying with less uh, chronic health conditions than some of their um, white peers and or counterparts. So even in children, COVID-19 has been destructive. Um, yes, children only are responsible for 13% of the known COVID cases as reported by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Children's Hospital Association in their February 2021 report. Um, but 241 children have died and any death is too many. Um, the, of those children who have died, we are seeing that same disproportionality in black and brown groups. Um, in a report at MMWR in September, the CDC found that more than three quarters of coronavirus deaths and children at that time had occurred in children of color. And even when um, children of color are not dying from coronavirus, but when they're the multi-inflammatory syndrome in children, uh, multiple system inflammatory syndrome in children, um, we've seen disproportionately 66% of those cases have occurred in Latinx or Black children. So moving from how there's been disproportionate impact by race and ethnicity um, in coronavirus cases um, and coronavirus hospitalizations and death. I want to also think about another health inequity that we've been struggling with. What's a health inequity? If you understand that health equity is the um, ability for each person or the opportunity for each person to achieve their highest level or state of health. Uh, health inequity is any barrier, an unjust and avoidable barrier that prevents a person from achieving that health equity. Health inequities are different or can be distinguished from health disparities. Health disparities are the differences in outcome by race, ethnicity, gender, or geographical or socioeconomic um, status or factors. So here we know that historically black and brown persons have not participated in clinical research at levels um, that is um, equivalent to their population share. Uh, there was a concerted push to undo that inequity in the coronavirus vaccine trials. I would not say we did undo it in totality, but we definitely achieved um, a measure of success and we had not done previously. Here you can see how many people were enrolled in each of the trials. Um, I just want to caveat that the Pfizer um, information gives you both global data and U.S. data in that one category of Hispanic slash Latinos, but you can see it. 10% to 13% roughly Blacks participated in each trial, anywhere from 13 to 26% Latinos, um, and you see 0.6 to 1% of American Indian and Alaska Natives, 0.2 to 0.5 of Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islanders, and 4 to 7%. And these are more on par or parallel with their uh, population share. Okay, COVID-19 vaccinations. So as of yesterday's information at 1226 p.m., we had administered in the United States over 110 million coronavirus doses or vaccines. Of that, about 39 million were fully vaccinated, roughly represented about 12% of the population, um, but about 15% of the population older than 18, equivalent to or older than 18. 
Here are just some more trend lines for us to follow. As of March 10th, 2021, um, there had been over 2.6 million doses administered in a day, and the seven-day moving average was above 2 million doses a day. We've even achieved a higher um, daily um, administration rate than, date uh, amount than that. Uh, Again, vaccination data by race and ethnicity to see that not only have we had disproportionality in a morbidity or disproportionality in mortality or you know known disproportionality of participation and efforts to reverse it, but we've seen disproportionality by race and ethnicity in those who have been vaccinated. So if you look at the information based off of March 16, 2021 at 1226 p.m., and knowing that this data was only available in 53% of those who had received one dose and 53.5% of those who had received two doses, these are the breakdowns by race and ethnicity. So looking at the fully vaccinated, approximately 7.2% um, Hispanics, uh, approximately 1.7% American Indian Alaska Native, 4.1% Asian, 6.8% Black, and 0.2% um, Native Hawaiian, and multiple 11.2%. And if you look at New Jersey's information, as of March 16th, over 3 million doses have been administered, um, over a million had been fully vaccinated, and in information known or data available on the New Jersey COVID-19 hub, you can see the breakdown by gender, um, you can see the breakdown by race and ethnicity, you can see the break breakdown by age, and even which products had been administered. And again, we see black and brown groups lagging in comparison to their uh, representative share of the population. And finally, just thinking about um, where are people moving in their willingness or eagerness to get vaccinated, I like to caveat all of this by saying I think far too much attention or the narrative has talked about vaccine hesitancy when the narrative should talk about access to vaccines. Because what we know is that if you look at the definitely not or the only if required, Blacks are not necessarily different from Hispanics or Latinx or white persons. Where you saw some fluctuation in particular in this Kaiser Family Foundation poll is in that wait and see category, meaning there were specific information needs, meaning there were specific um, communication needs that needed to be met for persons in those groups to say, yes, I can move from awareness to motivation to intention to the completion of the action and follow through but there's been progress nonetheless in that wait and see category from a high above 50 in December to about 34% as of February, eagerly waiting to see what that March data will look like. This is in the, the Latinx population. Again, looking at that blue line, you've seen the drop in the wait and see category. Um, it's been pretty stable around only if required or definitely not. And you've seen an increase in already gotten or as soon as possible. And again, if we look at this in the white um, population in the United States of those who participated in the surveys, um, again, you see improvement in already gotten or as, as soon as possible. Um, you see a decrease in wait and see, and you also see that plateau or that stabilizing amount of only if required or definitely not. And finally, um, this poll I found very, very interesting, which was just released last week, um, NPR, PBS NewsHour and Marist survey looking at 1,227 U.S. adults. And if the, if the question was asked, if a vaccine for the coronavirus is made available to you, will you choose to be vaccinated? Look at the bottom of that graph. Look at white versus black. There isn't a wide gulf or disparity there. 28% um, of whites said no. 25% of blacks said no. Uh, unsure was also roughly tracking the same. So again, that's why I say collectively, are there pockets of slow to yes, wait and see, or even vaccine hesitancy in black and brown groups? Yes. Um, are there historical factors driving that? Yes. Are there contemporary present day um, factors related to racism and disparities? Yes. But are there factors related to convenience barriers? Yes, meaning transportation, meaning logistics, meaning information. Is it communicated in socially, culturally fluent terms? Um, meaning um, is it communicated in plain spoken health literate terms. Yes, 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 yes. As the New York City Department of Health would say, when you make the healthy choice, the 
easy choice, people are more li likely to convert on a health-seeking behavior, and hence why so many efforts have to go into vaccine equity, elevating the voices of those in the peer groups, of those who have historically not received access to vaccines or have not been vaccinated at rates as equivalent to the majority of the population, um, making sure that the information is penetrating through multiple modalities. It's getting exactly two people in the format that they are, are able to access in a way that is understandable. Um, and it's being carried by trusted messengers. Very, very important. And then we're thinking through all of the logistical barriers, hence why we need a block by block strategy, even door knocking if necessary by community health workers and others to ensure that opportunity and access is being increased and enhanced so that when people given that option, the healthy choice can be the easy choice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Purnell. Yes. First of all, um, thank you so much for sharing uh, your story with your family and your, your dad, is his smile is so beautiful mm -hmm. and um, we are sorry for your loss, but thank you for sharing that. Um, and thank you for this wealth of knowledge. And I'm going to go look at some questions that we have for you, if that's okay. Sure. Okay, great. Okay, here we go. Hearing that people are getting COVID even though they have gotten vaccinated, what could be some of the reasons for this happening? Okay, so timing right? It's very important around timing. What we know is when the studies um, reported or declared their data, the clinical research trials. So let's talk about Pfizer, Moderna. So you heard numbers like 94.5 or 95% efficacy, meaning in the clinical trial setting, that's how effective those vaccines were at re in reducing um, known disease in the vaccinated group versus the unvaccinated group. So you had a 95% reduction in the vaccinated group or 94.5% reduction in the vaccinated group versus the unvaccinated group. And with Johnson & Johnson um, it has different numbers. I want people to know that there's a difference between the clinical setting and the real world scenario, okay? So it's being fully vaccinated meaning receiving two doses if it's a two-dose vaccine or one dose if it's a one dose and plus two weeks thereafter. So the immune system can have the most robust response that you even approach those efficacy rates, right? And so what you see happening at times is that people could have been exposed in between their first and their second dose. So they're not fully vaccinated or more commonly, you could see people getting vaccinated and having already been exposed, but not knowing that they're exposed. And then the last option, and now I'll, I'll expound on J&J's numbers I didn't before. So J&J had an efficacy around 72% in the U.S. trials, 66% overall. But J&J tested at a time when there were more variants than Moderna and Pfizer did, okay? So J&J specifically tested in South Africa where we have um, the variant that has caused lots of havoc. Um, and there have been additional studies um, by of, of Pfizer and Moderna to see if their vaccine was as effective against those variants. While the, the, the variants are able to evade the immunity somewhat of both the Pfizer and the Moderna, there are those vaccines are still effective. So that's that third scenario that we could be seeing, right? So a person could be exposed to a variant, the variant is able to evade the immunity somewhat, and perhaps the person is being infected with that particular strain. Great, thank you for that explanation. Here's another question. Are there specific efforts being made here in Essex County and in New Jersey to address these inequities? We've seen on the news the role of faith-based outreach to get vaccine buy-in. What do you know about that? Sure, I can tell you about what we're doing here at University Hospital. So in my role, um, and I said I wanted to infuse examples as much as possible, this office, the, the Chief Strategic Integration and Health Equity Office, um, is tasked with thinking through the most robust health equity rollout. So we have an equity and inclusion governance structure. In addition to that governance structure, we have work groups that focus on patients, 
workers, and community. And we've begun to articulate and design goals unique to community, unique to patients, and unique to our workers of how to achieve health equity and equity and inclusion more broadly, okay? So with that framework being shared with you, we at University Hospital have been very aggressive in how we communicate. And we started doing that over the summer, realizing there are unique needs of our communities who have been vulnerable, marginalized, or historically excluded, um, and ensuring that we're communicating through trusted messengers, so through partnerships and collaborations with faith-based settings, through trusted medicine your provider versus an FQHC versus University Hospital. Building upon that, we've done additional efforts where we're doing outreach to our patients, our patients who are high risk, um, our patients who are eligible by criteria to ensure that they know that they have access to the vaccine here at University Hospital. Um, we have partnered with community providers to ensure that they have access to the vaccine. And we have partnered with the city of Newark to think about some of those harder to reach but very hard hit communities or pockets of community to support them in their efforts. And now that we have a more mobile um, option in J&J, &J, you're seeing the mobile van. So we've supported the city of Newark in their mobile administration of vaccine at senior citizen buildings. We're doing days designed for se certain segments of the population, vaccinations for teachers, um, vaccinations for transit workers. So those are some of the examples. And as the state eligibility criteria open up, and as the, uh, um, let's say the supply expansion we need to push deeper into community. And that's what the hospital is looking to do and other anchors are looking to do, whether it's the county, the hospital per se, your local provider, or faith-based groups partnering to make sure we're getting out the information to the groups that have been hardest hit and that we actually have vaccine products at the point of engaging in dialogue. Wow, that you're doing a lot. I, I hope um, we can create some type of a model that gets rolled out everywhere, but that is wonderful work. I have another question for you. Uh, could you add a few words on the barrier undocumented persons face in obtaining the vaccine? Yes, and so to, so you know University Hospital, we are a public academic medical center. So University Hospital treats anyone regardless of their ability to pay or re regardless of their immigration status. And I think it's very important that everyone understands that um, we're the largest provider of charity care in the state. And so what we're seeing um, in the immigrant communities and particularly among undocumented and documented immigrants um, is one, how does this reveal immigration status, right? How is health seeking behavior affected by immigration status because of policies and public charge being one of those policies, not wanting to draw down on public funds or public dollars because that um, being used to impact or to make more difficult, make more challenging the ability to um, have legal status um, in, the, in a state or legal status in this country, I should say. And so those are barriers that are unique to the immigrant and, and particularly the undocumented and documented communities. And then making sure we're just, we're speaking in terms that are socially and culturally fluent. I said that previously in my presentation, I'll say that again, what does that mean? It's not just speaking in someone's language, but it's speaking in health literate terms in someone's language that they can understand in a modality that is familiar to them and accessible to them. And we need to make sure we're doing more of that with our immigrant communities. I've been having conversations um, with um, local um, uh, groups, most recently, even in the, the East Ward of, of Newark, to think about how are we engaging um, where we're seeing hot spots in the city with test positivity rates disproportionately higher. So that's something we're actively thinking through ourselves. Fantastic. Uh, would you, um, would walk-in uh, access be beneficial um, than uh, and appointments as well? Do you think that would be a practical thing? It's a challenge, right? So walk-in access is a challenge. And uh, walk-in access has been a challenge even more so with the first two vaccine products because of the cold chain storage requirements. So both Pfizer and Moderna have to be kept at ultra cold temperatures. Pfizer even more ultra cold than the Moderna. They're messenger RNA vaccines. Um, they're volatile. There is this lipid 
polyethylene glycol substance that that mRNA is in to try to give it some more stability and integrity, but still um, they are susceptible to how they're being transported and they're susceptible at which temperature. Um, those two vaccines don't have the refrigerator shelf life that a J&J &J does. Uh, J&J has a three month refrigerator shelf life. So when you have a vaccine product that's a little bit more flexible, um, and this is a strength of J&J, &J, you're able to entertain the possibility for walk Otherwise, what you see happening at places that are offering vaccines, um, when there are excess doses, there is this rapid or um, outreach to persons who might be able to get a vaccine on demand right in there. But those are the challenges and the barriers that we're facing. Both Moderna and Pfizer are looking at alternate configurations of their product that would make them be more stable um, at warmer temperatures, uh, let's say relatively warmer temperatures. Um, but if that's that's the, the rate limiting step to the walk-in. But we need to think through what are the most mobile, knowing those barriers and those limits, what are the most mobile opportunities or logistics that we can engage an employee in so that people can get vaccinated? Great, thank you so much. I think, well, I have, I have one question. Um, okay. So, because you're so well versed in this, what what recommend what are your recommendations on how we can narrow this gap uh, in health disparities? What methods, practical mm -hmm. methods, can we do as people of the world to help you know bridge this gap? Okay, we're going to try to do this in brief. So I referenced Dr. Jones. Uh, if you have never read uh, Dr. Kamara Jones, her, her work, she is prolific in allegories, able to just explain um, difficult. Uh, subject matter um, through these allegories that I think people can connect with. So she talks about a gardener's tale to help explain um, the disparities that are born out of the inequities caused by systemic racism. And she groups three different factors driving those inequities. So there is a difference in access, right? So if we're thinking about how do you solve the differences in access, it's universal health care. Right. In addition to the universal health care, um, it's availability of care. Right. At times that are most conducive or convenient for populations, especially populations um, who are more economically vulnerable and can't miss time for work. So, uh, you know, advocating for the broader or the more latitude in the hours of provision of care and having that care as integrated into community as possible. Um, partnerships through uh, FQHCs, other social services agencies, right? So that's around access, okay? Then there are differences in quality of the care received. What can we do around differences in the quality of care received? One, um, you know, is improving and making more robust the pipeline. We need to have communities cared for by people who look like them. That's a fact that is emerging from the data. We need to increasingly have people cared for by people who look like them. In addition to that, um, I'm not just talking about nurse or physician providers. I'm talking about the complement of the multidisciplinary care team right? Because it allows you to have a similar lived experience and you can have consideration for factors that have impacted health seeking behavior or have impacted health outcomes. Um, and, and, and the other thing is to think about community health workers, right? They are part of that multidisciplinary care team. We all can think about how do we partner and collaborate to to design and develop a prevention army. Prevention armies can really help us ensure access, navigation. Convention armies can help us ensure we're communicated in a social and culturally fluent terms. Uh, these prevention armies can help us get at hard to reach communities. And then the very last thing we talk about are these the distribution of risk or the distribution of resources. People have differential distribution of risk or resources, social risk, clinical risk, right? And so those are those social determinants of health, where you live, where you work, where you play, where you pray, where you eat, where you age. And thinking through how can we develop health and all policies approach partnerships that say, 
Um, how do we develop more green spaces? How do we develop walkable streets, encouraging physical activity? How do we um, eliminate food scarcity or food insecurity? Um, access to affordable, nutritious food. What are the food pantries? What are the farmers markets? What are the where grocery stores plates? Those are just some quick examples. Some of those things we can do as one individual institution, but many of them we can't do by ourselves or, or silo. Oftentimes it requires partnerships and it requires the mobile of community assets, right? There are already assets in community. The mobilization of community assets to match and fulfill gaps that are being identified. Fantastic. Well, we're trying to do that here at the partnership and um, certainly you've shared a wealth of knowledge and we really appreciate that and you're motivational, I'll tell you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I love public health. <laughs> well, you can tell, and we've learned a lot. And thank you so much for your time. I know you're quite busy. And good luck in, in, in all that you do for making uh, this world better for, for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Great to be partners across the table. Great. Thank you. Have a great day. And Dr. Schwab, would you have any closing remarks for today? Well, thank you and thank you, Dr. Purnell. It was a wonderful presentation and I second that, very motivating. Um, I'm hoping we'll be able to work together on some of these issues along with our members from our uh, coalition here in uh, greater Newark and Essex County. Um, do we wanna have Kendra do some of the- uh, Yes, I think we have over? three minutes. I think we have three minutes left. So that would be great, Kendra. And before she starts, I'd like to just offer to, um, the members, if anyone has any updates that they'd like to share with the group, we traditionally do that verbally at the end of each meeting. But if you could send those in either through the chat or by email um, to the partnership, um, we'll get those organized and sent out to everybody through the email blasts that go out, as well as postings on Facebook. Um, so I'll leave it the rest to Kendra. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Okay. Hi, everyone. So my name is Kendra Julian, and I am the Adolescent Immunization Specialist um, at the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health. Um, so today I'll just be giving a brief overview about the education working group call. Um, so those who are um, unaware of the call, um, are just basically the purpose of the education working group call is to discuss um, immunization education opportunities and to discuss any future um, immunization education events. But because um, we are um, in the pandemic, everything of course went virtual. A lot of the work has been um, has been done virtual, of course. So um, but the HPV outreach um, for the, <clears throat> the last year, I have been providing um, some educational resource bags um, and I distributed to the colleges and universities for this quarter. I distributed 100 bags um, with HPV education, um, flu education to the students, um, just to kind of share that information and continue to increase um, awareness. Um, this quarter, I provided 50 bags to Seton Hall University and 50 bags to Morris County College. Um, I've continued my outreach to provide office, offices, um, pediatric offices, middle and high schools in the eight northern counties in New Jersey, um, just to kind of share my um, uh, support um, and provide additional resources. Um, as far as virtual education, on uh, February 22nd, um, Dr. Gora Summers, a gynecologic oncologist, um, she provided a webinar on cervical, cervical carcinoma etiology. Um, this webinar is recorded. For those who are unable to attend, you can find it on the Partnership YouTube channel. Um, in honor of HPV Awareness Day um, on March 4th, my colleague Anal Patel and I uh, went live on um, our EMIC uh, IG page and we discussed the importance of HPV and oropharyngeal prevention. Um, and to see that live, you can also find it on our EMIC um, IG page. And last but not least, um, on March 25th, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Beanstock and uh, Dr. Sam Marquine from Zupa Health Center will be presenting on a webinar, um, giving it a great shot and interprofessional approach to improve human papillomavirus HPV vaccina vaccination rates. Again, that webinar will be on March 25th. 
um, if you unable to, you're unable to join, um, it will be recorded and again, um, uh, put up on our YouTube channels, um, but there's still some time to register. So that's all I have for now um, in regards to um, the education working group updates. Um, just to let you know, for those who are unfamiliar, um, I host these calls twice for the quarter. Um, our next call will be in April. So if you are interested and you don't have my contact information, you can um, reach out to uh, Colleen and she can share your information to me and I can add you to the next call. So thank you everyone and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank, thank you, everyone. I guess I'm. it's in my hands to close out our EMIC meeting today. I'm Dr. Esme Sharp. Thank you, Dr. Schwab. And I want to thank our speakers, Dr. Purnell and Dr. Fisher, for giving us a very informative, outstanding presentation. We appreciate all our EMIC members of the coalition that have attended today. Um, we will be in touch with you in the near future for our upcoming meetings and yeah, thank you everyone for all the hard work and I think this was a great meeting so I appreciate it. Thank you everyone. Okay.